Hi, this is Katie Burrows with Clara Maza. Um, we're about to get started. I'm just going to give um, everyone another minute or so to uh, log on and then we can go from there. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, thank you everyone for uh, joining us today. Um, Tim Valley and I are going to be um, presenting this webinar, which talks about the missteps in the bid protest process um, and war stories from the trenches. Um, essentially, we will be walking through the bid protest process itself and um, also talking about, you know, potential traps and, uh, pitfalls in going through that process. And those traps and uh, pitfalls are, you know, whether you're new to the bid protest process or have been through it uh, many a time, they can still catch you. So they're important to take note of. Um, and uh, I, I am uh, the bid protest practice leader at Polera Maza. Um, so I am in the government contracts group, and so I do handle a wide range of government contract matters, um, including claims and requests for equitable adjustment, uh, false claims act matters, you know, uh, termination proposals, so on and so forth. Um, but my main focus is bid protests, and Polera Maza handles upwards of 80 bid protests a year, um, whether that's on the protester side or the intervener side. So I will then turn it to Tim so he can introduce himself. Hi, everyone. My name is Tim Valley. I'm an associate here at Polera Maza in the GovCon group. I've been working on bid protests for a little over four years now, um, including with Katie. Um, I work on a number of matters at the firm, um, whether it's protests at GAO or COFC or the SBA. Um, I also work on a number of regulatory compliance matters. Um, intellectual rights or intellectual property and data rights, I should say, and False Claims Act audits and investigations. Um, but a, a lot of my time is spent on bid protests, uh, including with Katie. So uh, happy to be here today and thanks for joining us. Um, just a little bit about Polera Maza before we get started. We are a full service law firm. So while we do um, have a large number of government contractor clients, we also do uh, represent um, companies in the commercial world um, in a whole range of different types of uh, industries and in areas. Um, as it says here, we do audits, investigations, obviously bid protests, which we'll be talking about today, um, corporate transactions, mergers, acquisitions, labor and employment. It really runs the gamut. Um, so that being said, uh, Tim and I both do focus on government contracts. So if you have any questions regarding Polera Maza, feel free to ask them later in the program. And um, also just, you know, before we get started, there is a, a section you can ask some questions if you have any, which we will do our best to get to um, at the end of the, the program here today. So with that, we can go ahead and get started with the reason you guys are all here. Um, so just to give you a quick overview, um, you know, today we're going to walk through bid protests, you know, who, what, where, when, and why. So we're really going to be talking about, um, you know, when to file, where to file, the various pros and cons of each of those places, um, and also uh, issues with regard to timeliness. Um, and uh, we're also going to be touching on why it's important to defend your ward against a protest. Um, so uh, as an intervener. And then at the end, like I said, we'll do our best to get to questions and answers. So, um, you know, just to start with some of the basic uh, principles of bid protests, um, uh, you know, bid protests in, in its most basic form is a challenge to um, an agency's, you know, procurement actions. 
Um, and today we'll be talking about federal procurement actions. Um, there are, are also, you know, state actions that you can take, but those laws are very, and regulations regarding state and local bid protests are very, very uh, state and jurisdiction specific. So today we're just going to be focusing on um, federal procurement. Um, so it is important to note that a bid protest is different for, from a size or status protest, um, which we, we won't be touching on size or status protests today, but um, those are challenges to the size or the socioeconomic status of the awardee and are handled by the U.S. Small Business Administration. So the uh, two types of bid protests, which we'll be talking about um, in much more detail today, are pre-award protests and post-award protests. Um, and there's various places where you can file, um, you know, a pre-award and a post-award protest, which we'll be going into um, in more detail later in the webinar as well. But um, as an initial matter, the you know three main places that are the agency. You can file an agency level protest. You can file a protest at the Government Accountability Office, and you can file a protest at the um, at the Court of Federal Claims. Um, you know, with one caveat that the um, FAA procurements, the Office of Dispute Resolution for Acquisitions called ODRA, handles those bid protests for FAA procurements. Um, so, one of the major parts about protests is deciding whether to protest in the first place because it's always bad news to learn that you didn't get a contract, but you don't necessarily have to protest. And it can be a tough decision sometimes because there are both legal implications and business implications that you have to consider. Um, one of the main things you have to consider is whether you have factual support for your arguments, meaning you can protest, but can you make arguments to eventually prevail? Um, do you have enough facts to survive a request for dismissal? Um, and do you have time? Do you have resources? Protest costs money. Uh, so the point is there are a number of factors. Um, when working with a, a law firm, uh, you know, working with Blair Mazza, I often tell clients that protests are collaborative, meaning that when you go to a firm and you want to protest, you are the expert on your proposal um, and the RFP. It's very likely that whichever attorney you hire definitely hasn't read your proposal and probably is not very familiar with the RFP. So, you know, we'll talk shortly about timelines, but typically there's not much time to file a protest. So it's a collaborative process where we're gonna say, well, what strengths should you have gotten in your protest? You know, why is the agency's evaluation unreasonable? So we're gonna be working together with you to get the facts together so that we can make legal arguments and put this protest together for you, often sometimes in under five days uh, and under 10 days sometimes. So what are some of the you know, other critical questions to ask yourself when you're deciding whether to protest? So are you the incumbent? Um, incumbents often protest and sometimes they protest not because they think they have a valid protest, but because simply filing a protest can get you a bridge contract. Um, it can allow the contract that you're currently under to keep moving. Um, it's also sometimes very difficult for an incumbent to that's ostensibly been doing really well, they've gotten good CPARs, um, to find out that they lost a contract. Um, we hear often, there's just no way someone could do this better than me. Um, but that might be the case. Doesn't mean someone can't put together a better proposal though. So this can be shocking um, and you don't want it to cloud your judgment, but you also just want to decide, does it make sense to put this on pause for someone else um, to maybe interrupt a process for the agency, your current client? Um, and is it worth it moving forward? Because again, it can be pretty pricey, but more often than not, and, and we'll get into this a little bit later, um, depending on the outcome you're looking for, it might make sense to just put together a protest and file it. 
Um, another thing to consider, um, you'll, you'll get your notice of award, you'll get your debriefing, and you'll get some limited information, um, including the awardee's price, um, and often you'll get some adjectival ratings. So one thing to consider, uh, depending on the procurement, is has the awardee just essentially blown you out of the water in terms of uh, scores and price? Um, you know, if there's a price realism evaluation in the solicitation, which means essentially is their price too low, uh, you might be able to attack that. If there is no realism evaluation and their, their price is low and it's best value and you, you don't know if you're going to be able to beat it and they've scored higher than you, you know, that's a difficult protest to prevail on unless you find some other issues. Um, another question is, and this is sometimes hard to swallow, but did you make a mistake in your proposal? Uh, and did the agency catch you? Um, I, I've never seen a perfect proposal. Um, I'm still looking for it, but you know, I often see mistakes both in the awardees and in um, someone that's lost a contract. So it's, it, it's sometimes a hard pill to swallow, but if the mistake is fatal enough that you lost the award, um, you know, you have to consider that when deciding to protest. Um, I also mentioned impact on customer relations. Um, and another important consideration is, do you have teammates in this? You know, do you have subcontractors, JV members that may not have resources? So are you footing the bill or are they footing the bill? Um, or is everyone in and they're just going to, and you're going to pull your resources and, and go for it because you know the agency did something wrong and it's evident just based on the initial documents you get. Um, so those are all just really important factors for deciding whether to protest. And again, it's a short timeline and it's working both on this business side and on the legal side to decide whether it makes sense um, when you find out you lost. So are you an interested party? Um, if, if you're going to protest, you have to be an interested party. And I'll, I'll read you the GAO definition. Uh, it's in the regulations. It's an actual or prospective bidder or offeror whose direct economic interest would be affected by the award of a contract or by the failure to award a contract. Um, this means that if you, if you didn't bid on this procurement uh, you, and you find out, you know, maybe some company, you know, Amazon or Microsoft or whoever won an award and, and you hate Microsoft, but you had nothing to do with that procurement, you, you're not allowed to protest that. Uh, you're, you're not an interested party because um, you didn't submit anything. And so you, unfortunately, cannot get involved. Um, and this has been both GAO and Court of Federal Claims, um, case law and regulations. So this is a, a preliminary, um, part of filing a protest. Do you have a direct economic direct economic interest? Um, at the court and GAO, um, direct economic interest essentially means, do you have a substantial chance of winning the contract? If you do not have a substantial chance of winning the contract, even if you were right in your protest about every single argument, you therefore would still not be an interested party. Um, now, that typically comes up more often in a um, lowest price, technically acceptable procurement, also called an LPTA procurement, which means they're basically doing an acceptability review of your technical proposal uh, and then looking to see who has the lowest price amongst technically acceptable offerors. And whoever is the lowest price gets the award. Now, in terms of a protest, if you if it's an LPTA basis and you're fourth in line for award, um, so even if they did something wrong with the technical, uh, you're still fourth in line for award. So you're not next in line on that procurement and arguably you're not going to be an interested party. Now, sometimes you don't know that. So you don't know where you landed in the line. So sometimes you protest and we tell clients, well, well, we'll get the record and we will let you know um, and we can withdraw. But sometimes you have to decide, do you just want to take the risk and put the money forward to get the purchase drafted and submitted before we get the administrative record? Um, and then you go from there. 
Um, that's post award, uh, pre award, and, and we'll get into this a little bit more. But um, that means no award, of course, has been issued. But typically, uh, we always advise submitting a proposal um, prior to the solicitation due date for proposals. Um, that typically satisfies um, you in terms of qualifying as an interested party for pre-award, but of course it gets more complicated than that. But Frederick, I'm ready for next slide, please. So debriefings, um, debriefings are a place where people really can get tripped up um, for numerous reasons. Uh, First and foremost, debriefings are not required for every procurement type. So in a FAR Part 8 procurement, um, for example, you're not entitled to a debriefing. You're entitled to a brief explanation, which can provide very limited information. But putting that aside, um, in uh, procurements that do um, provide for debriefings, um, you know, it's really important to pay attention to the rules. Um, because debriefings, um, you know, filing deadlines are keyed off of debriefing dates and, um, you know, debriefings are where, you know, contractors can really gain the most amount of information um, to determine whether or not they want to protest. Um, so, you know, it's very important to request a debriefing within three days after you received notice that you did not win. And this is whether or not you were um, excluded from the competitive range before award, or um, you know, if you learned at the time of award that you were an unsuccessful offeror. And the reason that this is really important is because if you're debriefing, well, the protest deadline typically, like I said, keys off the debriefing date. So you have five days after the debriefing to file and get an automatic stay at the at um, GAO or within 10 days after your debriefing if you aren't, um, you know, if the automatic stay isn't important to you, although it is typically for most contractors. Um, so, but that's only for a debriefing that is requested and when requested is required so if you ask for a debriefing on day four it's not it's no longer a required debriefing so that five days isn't going to get keyed off they're not the agency doesn't have to give you a debriefing so and even if they do give you a debriefing like i said it wasn't a required debriefing so you really have to pay attention um, to the deadline there um, the other thing is often, you know, when requesting a debriefing, you want to make sure that it's day three um, is typically going to be 4.30, uh, you know, in the time zone that the agency's in, unless, you know, the solicitation or um, an earlier document, you know, the notification document provides otherwise. So, you know, you do need not only to keep track of the fact that it's day three, but it's 4.30 on day three typically. Um, so that's one of the ways people can get tripped up. But another way, and this is not unusual, is that when people get eliminated, contractors get eliminated from the competitive range, you know, they have the opportunity to request a post-award debriefing or a pre-award debriefing. Um, we typically always um, advise contractors to request the pre-award debriefing. Um, and the reason that this is important is that, you know, GAO keys its deadlines off of, you know, basically the earliest of when you knew or should have known. And if you give up your right to a pre-award debriefing and only ask for a post-award debriefing, your date is not going to get keyed off. That five-day time period is not going to get keyed off of the post-award debriefing deadline. Um, so it's just something to keep, you know, note of. Um, the other thing about debriefings is that GAO will consider that your debriefing occurred on the earliest date offered by the agency. So to maximize the time available, it's best to accept the first date that the agency proposes 
if that's impossible, then you should, you know, use the offered date as the protest clock starter. So say they offered, you know, a debriefing on, you know, June 15th, you couldn't do it that day. So it turns out it's going to be June 18th. You should just assume that the, the protest clock started on the 15th and not the 18th um, in order to be timely. So um, the other thing that, you know, sometimes can trip people up is that the agency will also often include what they call a debriefing or debriefing materials with its, um, you know, award notice or notice of unsuccessful offeror. Um, and so you might think that the debriefing request isn't necessary in that case, but that's not accurate. Um, the statute requires that a, a debriefing request so you need to make the request because um, only when you request the debriefing is it required. Um, so make the request and uh, otherwise your protest in the automatic stay could, could be on the line with regard to that. Um, let's see, another issues to keep track of. Um, I think that's, oh, well, enhanced debriefings. The other thing, um, for DOD procurements, um, Department of Defense issued a class deviation, which is 2018-0011. And that class deviation provides for enhanced debriefings for DOD procurements. And that means when the agency is providing a post-award debriefing of offerors um, in accordance with FAR 15506, contracting officers have to include in the debriefing information um, provided to unsuccessful offerors uh, an opportunity to submit additional questions relating to the debriefing um, within two days of the debriefing. So basically you have your debriefing, within two days you can ask follow-up questions and the agency is required to respond to those additional questions um, you know, they're supposed to respond within five days after receipt of those questions. Um, and the reason that this is important is because the post-award debriefing for these DOD enhanced debriefings isn't going to be considered concluded until the agency delivers its written responses to you. So if you have your, you know, debriefing on the 15th, you ask questions on the 16th, and the agency gets back to you on the 20th, your protest isn't due if you want to get the automatic stay for five days after the 20th, as opposed to five days after the 15th. So asking those additional questions can really buy you some time in the, in the uh, DOD world. So I think we're ready for the next slide. Uh, oh. I think you skip one. I should note, I think there one of the questions was whether the three days is considered business days or calendar days. Um, I believe it's business days, but I will go back and check that. No, I take that back, it's calendar days, sorry. Go ahead, Tim. So for Pre-award protests and some other potential pitfalls we wanted to flag for everyone was you cannot challenge an impropriety in a solicitation after proposed after the proposal due date. So if there's something in a solicitation that is you know patently ambiguous, clearly erroneous, um, problematic in, in some way, you need to challenge it before the proposals go in. If you challenge, if you try to challenge it after the proposals go in, GAO and the court will essentially dismiss your protest as untimely. Um, at GAO, that's written right into their regulations. Um, they're very strict on it. At the court, um, they there's a case called Blue and Gold um, and its progeny, which have uh, evolved the standard um, that essentially enshrine GAO's uh, regulations that say you have to challenge the solicitation before proposals go in. Um, so a common mistake is waiting 
until after award. You didn't know about this rule. Um, and then you don't win. And you say, well, this is unfair. The evaluation scheme was, you know, said this. We, we don't think it should have been this way. They should have done it differently, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, you can't challenge that. Uh, it'll just get dismissed immediately. Um, the, the only caveat I'll add is if something is latently ambiguous, um, you can challenge that. It, it's the one exception, really. Um, but it typically does not reveal itself because it's latent uh, until the evaluation occurs. Uh, and then you're kind of stuck protesting it and, and fighting it out with the agency. Um, you, you can win on latent ambiguity, but it, you know it's typically a little bit more involved of a protest and uh, you know it's competing rationales and interpretations of the parties. Um, so it, it, bottom line, if there's something in the solicitation that you don't like, or something that occurs um, before proposals are due, um, you got to protest it. Or um, the other route is if you have enough time, you can send a letter to the agency. Uh, we often submit anonymous letters on behalf of clients to the agency if they if they don't want their name on it. Uh, you can of course submit questions. You just want to get those in before the deadline, um, and just you know put it in front of the agency, and you know it's part of the process that. It, they, they want to put forth good solicitations. Um, sometimes they don't change it, but more often than not, if you, if you write a pretty good letter explaining your rationale, they're going to want to avoid it, and especially if you mention a potential protest because they don't want to get protested. Um, so what are some examples of pre-award protest? Of course, um, imp improper, unclear solicitation terms. Um, essentially, if you don't like the term, protest it. Um, this could be anything from, you know, vague terms to inconsistent terms, or, it, you know, says maximum of 25 pages, the next page it says maximum of 30 pages. It's just things like that you just want to fix before proposals go in. Um, another one would be the solicitation limits competition. Uh, the government is not supposed to unduly restrict competition. Um, so, for example, if they, if they don't have a good rationale for using a certain brand and they're saying this is the only thing that they can use or they're restricting competition to certain um, to a certain awardee unjustifiably, um, that is a potential pre-award protest. Um, another one is, you know, failure to set aside the procurement. You can challenge them on the rule of two and on uh, marketing issues. Um, I, another one, and, and this is technically after proposals go in, so it's a little different, but after proposals go in, if the agency decides all the proposals need to be revised, um, they can technically establish a competitive range and engage in discussions solely with the, the offerors in the, de, in the competitive range. Um, if you get excluded, you can protest that um, and challenge the agency's determination that you should not have been in the competitive range. Um, so that's, those are a number of um, just examples of pre-award protests that you can bring. Um, so here are some other examples, and, and these might seem a little less obvious. Um, not enough time to prepare proposals. So in this case, um, sometimes uh, an agency will We'll drop a solicitation and give you, you know, five days to submit. Um, you can challenge that. Um, it, it it depends on which part of the FAR it's under, um, but broadly or or generally speaking, the agency should be giving offerors enough time to prepare proposals and essentially compete on an equal basis. Um, the same thing applies to amendments to solicitations, especially if the amendment is. Um, you know, right before a proposal deadline, if it's pretty substantial, you know, you could potentially protest the fact that the agency has not given you enough time um, to address the solicitation. Another pre-award protest example would be uh, OCI or organizational conflict of interest. Um, I think a lot of uh, government contractors would say, well, 
you know, that's post award because you, you don't know because they were awarded and, you know, how could you know if there's a conflict? Well, sometimes you can. Um, there's case law that uh, indicates from GAO that if you had a reason to know, um, you know, there's an unrestricted solicitation, um, you knew the facts, you knew that the offeror was going to be participating in the procurement for whatever reason, um, and you had reason to know that there's a potential OCI. They had a conflict for, you know, perhaps that they, you know that they helped draft the solicitation you're bidding on, or they have unequal access to competitively useful non-public information. If you don't raise that OCI issue before the proposals go in and you, and you knew about it, um, GAO could potentially dismiss that as untimely. So the, the real moral of that is if you know about something, um, at GAO at least, you have 10 days to raise it um, from when you knew or should have known. Um, so if, if you have a concern about something, um, you know, bring it up a legal counsel, potentially raise it with the agency. If they confirm it, then you, then you definitely know you're going to have to uh, potentially bring a protest. Um, another example is the improper cancellation of a solicitation. This is also something you can protest. Um, it's probably, it, it's very difficult to prevail on this type of protest. It, it has happened before, though. There is case law, both at GAO and the court of federal claims on this, um, but you can bring it. Um, and you can also, you can bring it post-award and you can bring it pre-award. The other thing you can challenge um, is inclusion or exclusion of improper FAR clauses. So, uh, you know, if, if there's a FAR clause that the agency wants to apply to your eventual contract and it's improperly in the solicitation has nothing to do with the procurement you, know, you can protest that um, so just look closely through these solicitations when you get them and you know have a have a keen eye and, and look for these inconsistencies and things that could affect you down the road um, because if you don't protest you're, you're kind of going to get stuck with it so one of the implications of filing a pre-award protest of course is that the agency in most cases, is going to be stayed from awarding that contract. Um, however, it can still evaluate. So the evaluation process will typically continue, uh, but they're going to be essentially stayed from awarding anything until the protest is resolved. Uh, one question we get a lot is, if you file a pre-award protest, should you still submit your proposal uh, we always say yes, um, and this goes back to the slide where we talked about being an interested party. If you don't submit a proposal, uh, the agency will more likely than not say you're not an interested party, and GAO or the court could potentially say you have no interest in this procurement, so you have no business being here, and they'll dismiss. Um, now, you could submit an incomplete proposal, and I, we've seen GAO case law, which says even though your proposal is incomplete, based on the relief you requested in your protest, which is to amend the solicitation to deal with the part of the proposal that you didn't complete, GAO would still find, based on that specific relief requested, that you are an interested party. Um, as a practical matter, you always want to try to get a complete proposal in if it's feasible, so you don't have to deal with this issue at all. Uh, you don't want to have to deal with a request for dismissal from the agency um, on interested party status. So um, you always just want to get your complete proposal in um, before you file your protest, um, or at least on the same day, just so you don't have to deal with that. And go with the next slide. So now we can move into post-award protests. Um, so you've submitted a proposal, the, the government has conducted its evaluation, and you find out that you did not win, unfortunately. So it's critical to understand that when you receive notice of a protest, um, it, it starts the clock ticking um, at 
the agencies and at GAO and ODRA for when you can submit your protest. And if you don't do it within those time frames, your protest could be dismissed as untimely um, or you, uh, could, uh, you could potentially not get a stay of your uh, contract award, which could be you know, detrimental in terms of what type of relief you'd want to get at the end or, or the, the relief you'd want to seek at the end. Um, so I typically say it's critical as soon as you get notice and you're and you think you might be protesting, you know, get a law firm involved and you know talk to your attorney about it and start figuring out those deadlines. Um, especially if you want to go to GAO, um, it's it's frankly a lot cheaper than the court. Um, and the it's typically the forum we go to. Um, if it's available, given that it's a lot cheaper and it's a guaranteed 100 days uh, for the most part that you're, you're going to get resolution. Um, so 10 days from when you knew or should have known. Um, as Katie was mentioning, there are debriefings and sometimes you will have information, but you have to wait until after your debriefing finishes to file. Uh, but generally speaking, 10 days is a good rule of thumb. Um, but again, it, it's not, you shouldn't just assume 10 days. Um, especially if you want to get a stay. Um, at the Court of Federal Claims, it's essentially sooner the better. Um, there's no near-term deadline. Um, there are doctrines at the court that will prevent you from moving on a protest if you wait too long, um, doctrine of latches. Um, but generally speaking, it, it's not the same 10-day or five-day window at GAO. Um, so a little different, but again, it's very expensive. Um, and the other thing to consider is if, if they're very far along in the contract award and performance, again, that could limit relief. So you'd want to go to the court sooner rather than later to um, make sure things are stopped before they've gone too far. So those are some of the considerations, just timing, money, stay of performance, et cetera. Um, so, Bottom line, act quick. Act quickly once you receive the award notice. Uh, if you're entitled to a debriefing, request it in writing within three days. Um, talk to counsel uh, about your preferred forum, um, whether you want to go to the court or GAO. Um, you know, one thing to consider with GAO that's I, I consider a negative is you're going to get a more limited record generally um, in terms of what the agency is required to produce with its report. For example. If you don't challenge the awardee's proposal, uh, which is often difficult to do, you're most likely not going to get it uh, at GAO. At the court, it is much more likely that you're going to get a fulsome record. Um, and uh, of course, once you get the award notice, depending under which bar provision the procurement is, you know, calculate your protest deadline. Um, meaning, do you have a required debriefing, um, or do you have a non-required debriefing? or a you know, brief explanation of award. Uh, you just want to figure that out as soon as possible. So what can you challenge post-award? Um, the big one is failure to evaluate in accordance with the uh, RFP. For example, um, you know, one that I always look for is you know, professional employee compensation plan evaluations. They often get this wrong. Uh, gover government agencies will cite to it and then not even perform the evaluation, not understanding the FAR clause and what it requires, um, or just failing to read your technical proposal or to calculate your price wrong. Those are some pretty standard failure to evaluate in accordance with the RFP uh, arguments that you can bring. Um, another one is treating offers unequally. So. You see this when two offerors happen to propose the same thing. It, happen, it happens quite a bit. And one offeror gets credit for it and the other doesn't. And that can be prejudicial. So they could have gotten a strength for it. You didn't. And your score was lowered. Um, that is potentially an example of unequal treatment. Another one is failure to evaluate price realism. We see this a lot, just like the professional employee compensation plan. Uh, agencies often get... <clears throat> this wrong by not doing it at all, um, or when they do do a price realism analysis, they 
uh, don't do it correctly. It's, it's a complicated analysis to do where you're trying to figure out whether the costs are too low. Another pretty common argument is failure to conduct a proper best value trade-off, meaning they relied on a um, flawed evaluation, an, an underlying flawed evaluation. They relied too much on adjectival uh, ratings and didn't really go into the substance of the proposals as they were as they were required to do. Um, perhaps they converted a best value procurement into an LPTA procurement, meaning they didn't really look at technical scores all that much. They said, this guy's acceptable, lowest price, let's just make a word to them. You can challenge that. Um, another one is inadequate, misleading, or unequal discussions, meaning that they did not bring you into parts of your proposal that were significantly weak during discussions. Um, and then later on, they dinged you for it and never brought it up. Um, that is something you can challenge uh, because agencies are required to lead you into areas of your proposal that are significantly weak during discussions. It's, it's not every weakness, but it's, if it's significant enough, you can raise it as unequal or misleading. So all that said, the best arguments you can bring are you know, what we call the black and white issues, um, where you can just clearly show that the agency did something wrong and that it prejudiced you, meaning it cost you the award. The hardest arguments to win, however, are where you don't disagree, where you disagree with how the agency evaluated your proposal, and you think that you should have gotten strengths here, or you shouldn't have gotten a, a weakness here. Uh, those are typically very difficult to win because ultimately it is a subjective analysis where the, the technical evaluation team gets a lot of discretion in how they look at your proposals. Um, if it's in, if it's within the realm of the evaluation scheme, um, GAO and the court are not likely to uh, overturn that. Um, so, uh, suspending contract performance. This is another pitfall, and as Katie was mentioning, with the debriefing timelines. Um, it's critical not just to be timely for your protest arguments, but to uh, get a stay of award. Uh, and those dates can be different. So you're, you can file within 10 days of a debriefing to be timely, but if you wanna get a stay of award, it's, you have to file your protest within five days after the required debriefing. Um, so, and again, that can affect the relief you get at the end, which, if, if you don't have a stay and they're moving through contract performance, then you could potentially be stuck with proposal costs uh, and bid protest costs, which isn't great because you wanted the con you know the hundred and fifty million dollar contract, not you know costs for your proposal. Um, so you know an agency can override the stay, uh, but that's pretty rare, and you can also challenge that at the COFC. Um, now, if you go to the COFC and not the agency level or GAO, you can challenge, you can, you don't get an automatic suspension. Um, DOJ, who would get involved, not agency counsel, um, can agree to do a voluntary suspension of performance, which pretty much happens because they don't want to deal with um, going through motions for a preliminary injunction. Um, but if they don't do that, then you have to file motions for TRO and preliminary injunction, which can be very costly. Um, unlike GAO, which it's just automatic. Um, and at ODRA, unfortunately, it's almost impossible to, to suspend the contract. Okay, um, this is another pitfall uh, that many people don't know about, um, but the jurisdiction of, of GAO and the Court of Federal Claims and agencies uh, depends on whether it's a task order or a contract. Um, for federal supply schedule task orders, um, the, these are essentially, you know, schedule procurements. Uh, you can protest at any forum, regardless of the amount. Um, however, just to reiterate, you don't get a required debriefing. You get a brief explanation of award under FAR Part 8. Um, so you can ask for a debriefing. The agency will understand, but it's technically called a brief explanation of award, and you won't get as much information. For task orders issued under an indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contract, so you know, CIOSP3, Alliant2, um, 
those contracts, OASIS, um, you cannot protest task order procurements at the Court of Federal Claims or agencies. The exclusive jurisdiction is GAO, and only if it hits a certain monetary threshold. So for civilian agencies, it's $10 million. For DOD, NASA, and the Coast Guard, it's $25 million. Um, and it depends not on the ordering agency, it depends on the um, agency that issued the IDIQ contract. And keep in mind that IDIQ contracts, especially the government-wide acquisition contracts, can be, can be issued by a civilian agency, but then used by uh, the Department of Defense, NASA, and the Coast Guard, so, or vice versa. So if DOD issues a um, GWAC, but then someone else uses it, um, you're stuck with the $25 million threshold. Um, now, if you have a task order procurement and it's um, GSA and it's under 5 million or under 10 million, you technically can go to the ombudsman and file a fair opportunity complaint. Um, that is an option, but it's, it's not a protest and, and there's really no guarantee that anything would really happen. So just something to keep in mind when you're um, starting and whether it's starting in on your decision to whether you want to protest or not. And I'll turn it over to Katie. Great. Um, so, you know, Tim kind of touched on some of the pros and cons of um, filing at the uh, various forums, whether that's agency, GAO, or the Court of Federal Claims. Um, but with regard to agency level protests, we don't see them too often. Um, you know, as Tim had said earlier, we typically advise clients to file at, at GAO. Um, but, you know, there are pros to filing at the agency. Um, you know, it may be beneficial, you know, with customer relations. Um, agency level protests are typically adversarial. There is still the automatic suspension and they are, typically resolved within 35 days um, as opposed to 100 days at GAO or you know an unknown period of time at the court. Um, another uh, pro of filing an inter, uh, agency level protest is that typically the agency won't let the awardee intervene. Um, that being said, the cons are um, you know, the agency is reviewing its own decision. So, you know, obviously there's often some bias there and you're not, um, you know, the protest is not being reviewed by a neutral third party. Um, even though you often have the opportunity to have the protest um, reviewed at a level above the contracting officer, that's not always the case, but it is often the case. Um, the other issue um, or con at agent with agency level protests is that you know, unlike at GAO and the court where you, um, the agency has to produce the administrative uh, agency record, uh, you are unlikely to get any information at an agency level protest other than the agency level decision. Um, and the other, you know, potential con is that because uh, agency level protests are typically resolved within 35 days, uh, the contract suspension is, you know, not going to be any more than the time frame for which it's going to get resolved, unlike um, GAO, which is typically 100 days, or you know, you often would get the stay for that long. Um, a couple things to note about agency level protests too, and these are some, uh, you know, potential traps that um, contractors may find themselves in. If you lose your agency level protests and you want to go to GAO. GAO's bid protest regulations provide that the 10-day clock to file a GAO um, begins to run when you have actual or constructive knowledge of initial adverse agency action. And GAO has um, found that adverse agency action means um, any action or inaction on the part of the contracting agency that is pre prejudicial to the position taken uh, in a protest filed with the agency. So you may get some um, initial adverse agency action before you actually get the protest decision. So contractors need to be you know, hyper aware um, 
of that uh, possibility. The other thing at uh, for you know agency with regard to agency level protests is that if you lose your agency level protest and you want to go to GAO, any pro protest grounds that you didn't assert in your agency level protest are likely to be found untimely at GAO. So you know basically any protest grounds raised at GAO for the first time will likely be untimely. Um, you know assuming that you you know filed with you know outside of those you know 10 day the initial 10 day window so those are some things to be um, mindful of with regard to agency level protests GAO protests um, you know we have touched on a lot of this already but the pros again are the automatic suspension of, of award um, and performance um, it is the only forum for IDIQ task order protests um, and they do need to be resolved in 100 days, which is, you know, there's at least a, a fixed time frame there for that um, protest to get resolved. And then they are more informal um, than Court of Federal Claims protests. So as a result, they are um, simpler and they are less costly than filing at the Court of Federal Claims. Typically, you won't have a hearing at GAO. Um, it does happen, but it's rare as opposed to the Court of Federal Claims, which you would most always have a hearing. So that obviously adds additional cost. Plus, you know, if you do need to file a request for a temporary restraining order and a preliminary injunction and have a hearing on that, that's gonna be costly as well. Whereas uh, you wouldn't have to go through that at GAO. Some of the um, cons at GAO is that, you know, the strict deadlines that 10 days or five days, depending on, you know, what you're keying it off of, um, and, you know, they, the statistics at GAO are substantially in favor of the agency. Um, that's not to say that you're not going to win at GAO. It's just the agency protests are always an uphill battle and agencies are given, you know, a large amount of discretion in their decisions. Um, another con at GAO is that discovery, as Tim had mentioned before, is going to be more limited than at the Court of Federal Claims. Um, certainly greater than you would have at the agency level, but um, you know, agency counsel typically, typically tries to um, really limit the um, agency, the documents that are produced as part of the agency report versus you know, DOJ that typically produces a much more fulsome administrative record. And the other um, con at GAO is that GAO only makes recommendations to the agency. It cannot order the agency to do something. So it is possible that the agency won't follow the recommendation. That happens very rarely, um, but it is, it is a possibility. So um, this slide, uh, the GAO protest process, it's just a good reference um, for the filing deadlines at GAO and kind of what the schedule is at GAO. Um, you know, within that 100 day timeline, typically, you know, protest filed day one, 30 days later, the agency is going to produce the agency report. 10 days later, um, the protester and the uh, intervener have an opportunity to file comments on the agency report. If the protester fails to file comments, you know, the protest will get dismissed. Um, and then, you know, if you learned something in the agency report at day 30 that you didn't know previously, protester could file a supplemental protest, but it would have to be done within that 10-day window um, pursuant to the, you know, GAO regulations. And then again, the deadline for GAO to issue its decision is, is day 100. Um, so going on to the next slide, because I know we're running out of time here. Um, Court of Federal Claims protests, um, again, Tim mentioned deadlines for post-order protests are much more forgiving. There aren't strict deadlines at the court um, there is substantially more um, documents that are produced by the agency, so it's a much more fulsome record. You are dealing with the Department of Justice as opposed to agency counsel. Agency counsel is still involved, but Department of Justice is running the show. Um, and, you know, there is a potential to get a permanent injunction, but, you know, it's not guaranteed. And, um, you know, cons, again, it's not guaranteed, and it's typically substantially more expensive than a GAO.
So on the other end of the spectrum, you are the contract awardee and someone protests your award. Um, you then have the right to intervene in that protest, uh, challenging the award. And there, there are numerous reasons to intervene um, and numerous level of efforts because really the burden is not on you, uh, it's on the protester. So you can either take a back seat and kind of watch as things develop. You don't have to get involved at all. Um, or you can get really involved and help defend against the protest. So um, this is important because, frankly, not all agency counsel is created equal. And sometimes they need a lot of help um, and they don't have a lot of resources. And sometimes we're just helping them with legal research and writing and truly defending against the protest, which, which can be really invaluable. Uh, it, we can also help to make sure that the protester doesn't get more documents at GAO than they're entitled to, um, i.e. they don't get your proposal and get to dig around to bring more supplemental protest grounds. Um, intervener also has the right to seek uh, dismissal of certain protest grounds or narrow the issues. Um, we've had instances where we've moved to dismiss and the agency won't join us and uh, GAO moves on the dismissal and forces the protester to uh, respond. And we, you know, we've had some protests or portions of protests dismissed even when the agency wasn't doing it. Um, so you know, being an intervener can be really valuable. Um, the other end of that is sometimes the agency will decide to take corrective action after a protest is filed because they don't wanna deal with the protest. So, they're going to just reevaluate proposals. Um, if you have intervener, if, you, if you've intervened and you have counsel, they can fight for you to sh either shape the corrective action or avoid it in the first place. Um, and of course, you get to be a part of the conversation between the protester and the agency. I mean, sometimes it's potentially settling outside of a protest process, which has happened before. Um, but it's also just being in the conversation, being uh, in the know when it comes to information as much as possible. Um, so there's there's plenty of reasons to intervene in a protest um, and you'd wanna do that early on in the process. Um, and of course, what are the outcomes for a protest? Um, like I just mentioned, an agency can just decide to take what's known as corrective action, meaning they are going to reevaluate, they might cancel the award, they might keep the award in place, they might decide to amend the, the I'm sorry, <laughs> amend the solicitation. Uh, they could cancel the whole thing and start over. Um, that is uh, part of it. Sorry about that. Um, they can decide to take corrective action. That effectively ends the protest. Um, you can challenge the corrective action, of course. Um, GAO typically gives you a chance to weigh in, um, but then because there's corrective action, they typically dismiss because it's now mooted your protest. Um, or um, if the agency does not take corrective action, you fight the protest out through the bitter end and you ultimately get a decision on the merits uh, from both GAO or the court. Uh, GAO gives opinions, COFC gives orders, rulings, and opinions um, with you know, essentially injunctive relief. Um, and then if you do win, uh, you can try to go for attorney's fees at GAO um, on the meritorious issues. Um, Court of Federal Claims, it's much more difficult to get attorney's fees, um, but is possible in limited circumstances. Um, so that's all we have, and I, I, we can turn to questions now. Um, I guess we'll just start at the top um, of the questions box. Uh, join late. Uh, yeah, I, I believe so. Um, our the firm's marketing team will distribute the recording for everyone. Um, Katie answered the question about um, the three-day slides. Um, is there a threshold for the DOD enhanced, is there a monetary threshold for the DOD enhanced debriefing? Um, no, there's not a there's not a, a monetary threshold um, under FAR Part 15 procurements. FAR Part 16, um, our task order, procurements and those have only post-award debriefings are required over six million. Um, but in a typical FAR Part 15 procurement, um, there is no you know, threshold for the enhanced debriefing. Okay. 
Next, um, FAR 15.506 says that a minimum debriefing information should include the overall ranking um, when developed by the agency during source selection. What is the reason when agencies were asked about overall ranking, they would normally say they did not develop the ranking? Without that information, how do you know whether you're next in line or not? Um, yeah, sometimes agencies don't provide an overall ranking. Um, when it comes to a best value procurement, um, you would just have to argue that you're, you have a substantial chance for reward if they would have done a reasonable evaluation, i.e. your scores would have gone up and then the agency would have had to redo the best value determination for LPTA. Um, you might not know, as I was saying, and you just have to file the protest and, and see what happens. Um, slides will be provided. Are there ways for an unequal access to information pre-award protest is likely to succeed where the agency does not provide key information in the RFP that only the incumbent would have access to and is material to developing a proposal, e.g. how many people need to be staffed based on the agency rules, et cetera. Um, uh, it really comes down to how much information you know. I mean, this I, I assume this came up in the timeliness slide. Um, if you don't have reason to know prior to the proposal close date about an OCI, um, then you're arguably not restricted from raising the OCI issue um, post-award. Okay, did you have anything else to add on that one? No. Okay. Um, what if the proposal instructions are ambiguous to the extent that you are uncertain whether the evaluators will judge your proposal non-compliant? In that situation, you'd want to ask questions of the agency or submit a letter um, to get clarity on the evaluation instructions. Um, and again, it, if there's something like an impropriety in the evaluation instructions, you'd want to protest. Right, because any patent ambiguity, you need to protest before award uh, or before right. proposal submission. So. Can the intervener get their legal costs reimbursed when the agency takes corrective action? Pretty sure the answer to that is no. Typically, if the agency takes corrective action before it issues um, agency report, you're not going to get um, reimbursed for costs outright. If it's after the agency produces its written uh, agency report that they take uh, corrective action, uh, you know, there's certainly arguments to be made. Uh, you're much more likely um, to get your legal costs in that situation as opposed to them taking it earlier in the process. Um, if another company protests your award, at what point should you bring in the firm as a mediator? Um, the contracting officer is supposed to provide you notice of the protest um, and at GAO and at the court, you're supposed to be, the protester is supposed to file a redacted version of either the protest or the complaint that they file. Um, as soon as you get notice, um, that's when I recommend you bring agency, or I'm sorry, legal counsel in to intervene um, so that they can get access to everything and be there from the start. Um, sometimes the agency moves quickly and takes corrective action and you'd want agency counsel involved right from the start um, so that they can start advocating on your behalf. But there's no, of course, there's no absolute answer to this question. It's just um, you'd want, it, it's when do you want your representation? Um, and ideally you'd want that pretty quick. Um, so those are all the questions we have. Um, so thanks everyone for attending. Yeah, we appreciate your time. Um, if you guys, you know, if there's any more questions that you think of, please feel free to um, email me or Tim and uh, or we're happy to answer your questions. Um, relating to the to the webinar today. So thank you all. Oh, all right. and one last Thanks question. Can award, one last question here. Can awardee request a debrief? Yes, and I would always suggest that you do because if your award gets protested and somebody's making an argument about you know your technical capabilities or what have you, say the award gets overturned, um, and then you know agency get, takes corrective action, gives the award to somebody else. You know, you have some knowledge of what the agency 
how the agency initially evaluated and that may that information may help you subsequently so i would say absolutely request a debriefing um, as an awardee so um i think that's it and uh, again if you guys have any other additional questions please feel free to email us and we hope you have a great day and thank you again for attending thanks everyone take care